Thanks, Brian. You can have a seat. Well, with uh, the reading of God's Word and, and with your Bibles open, uh, hopefully to the book of Ruth, chapter 1, let me pray um, before we dive into this together, so pray with me. Father, again, we thank you for this day. It's your day. We thank you for your word before us. Thank you as we've been able to uh, even just stand as a symbol of respect for what's been read. It's your word. It's the words of God. So help us now. Lord, help me as I, as I preach. Fill me with your spirit. Lord, help me. I pray that you would um, speak to each one here through your word. So use me as, as a messenger, as a herald of your word, and I pray for each one here, um, whether new today, part of the church or not, Father, that you would shepherd them and guide them. So Lord, we uh, rely on you now, look forward to what you are going to show us from your word, and uh, pray, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in Jesus' name, amen. Well, um, Brian already uh, showed you where the book of Ruth can be found, and so four chapters after Judges, before 1 Samuel, at least in our kind of modern day order of the Bible. Uh, the book was written down, though, and this is important to know, kind of pen to paper, so you can picture as it's being written down, what was going on in the time that it was being written down is very, very important. It was a time when King David was no longer on the throne. It was a time very likely when Israel had already split. Civil war, you could say. And had been likely already taken over by pagan nations and then exiled out of their land uh, under pagan rule. So it's very important as uh, this author, and we don't know who he is, is writing this down. This is what's going on. And so the author, whoever he is, decides in that context, in that brokenness, in the destruction, while they're exiled under pagan rule, it is not the Israel that they hope for, the author decides to go back in history and write about something that happened a while back. And he decides to tell, us, and you, we know this, even chapter 4, verse 7, he, he decides to go back in a time when uh, customs and traditions were different. We know this in verse 1 that he goes back in a time when, and he says, the judges or the warlords ruled. So why did he choose when everything is broken and they're in exile under pagan rule? Why would he decide to go back into time and then pick that time? Let me write something to encourage God's people by writing about the time of the judges. I don't know if that would have been my first choice. You know, if I'm discouraged and things are rough, I want to hear a story. If I'm going to hear a story, I want to hear a story of the good old days. Tell me a story about the good old days. I think there's an old country song by the Judds. You know, Grandpa, tell me a story about the good old days. That's what I want to hear. Maybe. This is not the good old days. He says, and we're going to see, this is the time of the judges. Let me tell you a story about the time of the judges. And so, what do we know about it? Well, chapter 17, verse 6 of Judges says, In those days, so here's the description, there was no king. There was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so I got a, a chart up here for you, kind of show you then the book of Judges. So there's no king, everyone's doing what they think's right. And then, so this would be a, a little bit of the book of Judges then. This is what was going on in that time. There was idolatry. So people were living in wickedness and unbelief. Because of that, God's judgment came, and so oppression. They would cry out to God, and then God would deliver them with an imperfect judge, these warlords. But he would use them to deliver them. There would be a moment of peace, a time of peace. Back to the start of it, idolatry, and the circle just keeps going. So let me tell you about a story in the time of Judges. How is that going to encourage us? Well, the book of Ruth 
is written not to share a compelling love story between some girl named Ruth and some dude named Boaz. If you want to be real cool, you could say Bo. It's not the point of the story. In fact, I would say it's kind of a kind of a weird story if you're talking a love story. Like there's some scenes in there you'd be like, what? That's not helpful. Why would you put that? It would be confusing maybe. This is not a love story. Certainly not a love story about two people. This was written so that we would be convinced of God's love towards us, his bride. So in that sense, it is a love story, but not about Ruth and Boaz. It's about God's love between his people and himself, and, so, uh, and also that he redeems then out of love this people. In fact, the word redeem then, in our series, Christ our Redeemer, right? The word redeem in the book of Ruth, there's only four chapters, 20 times you'll find it in the book of Ruth. So that should tell us, okay, that seems to be important. The Holy Spirit of God wants us to understand redemption, to be redeemed, and, and maybe, maybe we should have talked about this a lot more because the name of our church is, does anyone know the name of our church? I often say, I maybe every Sunday say, hey, welcome to Redemption Church. Okay, what's redemption? Well, we talk a long time about this, and the book of Ruth is going to show us what this means. But a definition, real brief, would be this. It's to buy back or to rescue. Redemption is to buy back or to rescue. So certainly the idea of something is hopeless and helpless, and it's, we're going to buy that back, we're going to rescue that. And so this is something that we ought to know and be so convinced of as believers that there is no hope without redemption. And again, our series, Christ is our redemption. So Christ is our redemption, to be clear. And so, if he's our redemption, very simply, each one of us, you need to be redeemed by him. If he's our redemption, there's just no way around it. You must be redeemed by Christ. You must be rescued from him, or by him, from your guilt, from shame, from separation from your God, from your creator, from your king. You must be rescued from that, from the judgment of God due to your sin. You must be rescued and bought back and redeemed, bought by the blood of Christ. By Christ, no one else. He is our redeemer. You must be redeemed by him, by the body and blood of Christ, the substitutionary atonement. Jesus in your place, his blood, that is what must buy every one of us back. And so for some of us, we need to return to the God who created us, meaning we've been born into sin and we do not know this God. We have not submitted to him, we have not bent the knee. And maybe for some of us, we think that we have, but we actually never have. We've come close. But still, you must return to your God then. Who is your God, your creator? Now, if you've come to Christ, then Christ is our redeemer. He's your redeemer. Then he has bought you back. And because he's bought you back, you must continue to come back. He doesn't stop being your redeemer. It is a beautiful doctrine, redemption. He is our redeemer. He has bought us back, so we will continue to come back to him. Every time we stray, when past sins catch up to us, we will come back. We must return to him. When life is messy, we must return to him. We must. When we're anxious, when God seems unfair, when there's no hope in sight, we must return to God. Now, the book of Ruth will help us be convinced That Christ is our Redeemer. In chapter 1, that we need to return to our God. So the big idea is that. Return to your God. Return to your God. And three points this morning. And the first is this. Do not leave. Return to your God. First of all, do not leave your God. Verse 1 Let me walk us through this. Verse 1, 
He says, and again, the days of the judge, when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So what we know is there's a famine in the promised land. There's a famine in Bethlehem. And so it seems that Elimelech has no option but to take his family and leave. It's a famine. But the text doesn't tell us that he needed to leave. That God said to leave. It's assumed, well, he had no choice. But again, the text doesn't say that he had to leave. It would make sense based on the fact that there is a, a famine going on. But what's interesting is, again, he's not told to leave, but he did. And if you understand what his name means, and the readers, as they would read this, would be terrified to know what's next. Wait, you left the promised land, and his name means something very significant. Now, names don't really mean anything to us. I think we just kind of name, even, I mean, even us, like I think when I named my kids, I didn't put a ton of thought into like, what exactly is the meaning, meaning of this name? A lot of times it's, I like this name. If you've shopped at Ikea, we bought some things at Ikea not too long ago. Um, they have names. Um, before I show the picture, we bought uh, six Beveras. Clearly you know what that is. So we can just move on and you can know, right? Like that, me- that means something. Well, it does mean something. So here's a picture of what those are. There. Those are Beveras. I don't know if I'm even saying it right. That name means Bevera. Well, what, what did you buy? What, what, what would happen? Uh, did you buy a dog? Did you, did you buy a weapon? Did you uh, buy bag clips? That's what Bevera means. So we are told in verse 2, and you can take the picture off so you're not distracted forever by Beveras, but we're told in verse 2, the name of the man was Elimelech. Now, that's kind of a cool sounding name. I don't know if I met anyone named Elimelech. It was a good name, and it's a good name because it means my God is king. That's what his name means. That would even give goosebumps to the people reading this. Wait, his name is my God is king, and the name of his wife, Naomi, verse 2 says, was Naomi, and that's pleasantness. And now listen, the names of his two sons were Malon, that is sickly, and Kilion. That is spent. Now, Elimelech's father, who would have named Elimelech, chose to name his son, my God is king. Elimelech's father, there's even a chance that Elimelech's father was one of the second generation Israelites in the desert who made it into the promised land. Meaning, and if that's true, he certainly had a high view of God. Then he would have seen right, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire uh, by night over the tabernacle. He would have seen uh, manna in the desert, Jericho tumble, the Jordan split so they could walk over. And now a generation later, in the time of Judges, Elimelech may even mean like, yeah, my name is, my God is king. And he may even believe that. But they've lost hope. And they've forgotten that their God is their redeemer. And now they've named their kids without hope. There's, there's no way we can redeem this. Let's name them sickly and spent. We're also told they were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. There's nothing wasted here. Why would we hear this? They, they went into the country of Moab and remained there. The readers would have known, man, there's like royal blood here. Why did they leave? 1 Samuel 17, verse 12 says, Now David was the son of an Aphrathite of Bethlehem in Judah. His name was Jesse. We're told this for a reason. And again, it should should even make us just shocked. Why would someone named my God is king from the line of David lead his family Away from the promised land. Oh, because oh, there's a famine. Who cares the reason? That's not a good reason. Why would he do this? From Bethlehem. Bethlehem, the name, the name meaning house of bread. The city of David. To leave, likely the famine, because of judgment, and they leave. 
to Moab, the historical enemy of Israel, and whose god was Chemosh, pagan, awful god, human sacrifice. Why would they do this? And why would they try to find then redemption there? Sickly and spent, let's, let's go to Moab. What, what else can we do? I can imagine the hunger pains as they tried to make this decision. Day in and day out, there seems to be no change. You ever check the weather? You know, it's like no rain, no rain, no rain in this case. And what do they do? People dying around them. I wonder if there's family pressure on Elimelech. Maybe Naomi was saying, hey, like, maybe just the cries of the kids. Like, man. Maybe they saw others go. We don't know. We're not told. The temptation would be to go back to Moab. And they did that. And maybe you can relate to that. Man, like, what else can I do? Go back to maybe drinking, to your drugs, to your partying, to the relationship, to worry, go back to your lying, go back to yelling, isolation. And you'd say, because, like, what else can I do? When in reality... They were leaving their Redeemer. In those times, we would be leaving our Redeemer, searching for redemption some other way. And so, notice we're told that they went to Moab and they remained there. And I wonder if when they went, they had planned, look, let's just go road trip. I know it's Moab. I know it's outside of the promised land, uh, the, the place where... God resides with his people. It's like, we'll just go and get some supplies and come back. Like, we're not told that, but I wonder. But what we do know for sure is they didn't just go and come back. They stayed there. And they put down roots. And they died there. And you can see this in verse 3. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died. And she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives, which is interesting. They were commended very clearly not to do this. To take Moabite women as wives. And so um, they do this though. And the name of the one was Orpha. And the name of the other Ruth. Now we learn who these wives are. They lived there about 10 years we're told. And then Malon, Sickly, and Kilion spent, died. And you might think like, well, I kind of saw that coming maybe. (laughs) Maybe you shouldn't marry men with those names. I don't know. But they die. Dad's gone, the boys are gone, and we're told so that the woman, that is Naomi, was left with her two sons and her husband without even grandkids. She's got nothing. She's got nothing, and so it's interesting. They'd lost hope in how they named their kids. They moved to Moab looking again for redemption. And what they feared eventually actually happened to them. They didn't find redemption. The very thing that they feared came to their family, death. You know, Christ is our redeemer. So again, if you look to redemption from anywhere else, at the very simplest level, you will not find it. You might think that you found it. You might feel like, no, I think this is working. Christ is the only Redeemer, and he is our Redeemer. And so if you go to Moab, you will not find it. You will find the opposite, in fact. Otherwise, there are several Redeemers. So if you're looking to be satisfied without God, I promise you, you will be dissatisfied. If you're looking for purpose without the Lord, you'll be purposeless. Safety, unsafe. Hope, you will find No hope without God. Life, and in this case, death. Because Christ is our Redeemer. They should never have left. But here's the thing, is the pathway, the pathway to redemption is the same. It never changed. And so we must return to our God. And so this was what they needed to do. And leads us to the second point. Commit to return. Commit to return. The pathway is the same. They had no hope, but Christ is our Redeemer. They must return and commit to return to their God. 
no matter the cost. And so now the story, the story shifts to uh, describing their journey. They're going to head back now to, to God, ultimately. And so verse 6 starts and says, Then she arose with her daughters. So Naomi leaves with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Word on the street, or you could say in this case, like word in the fields, was, hey, there's food again. Like the famine's over, and it's a supernatural work. It's not just, hey, it started to rain, and I guess, yeah, it's fantastic. God has visited his people. God is there, and he has been gracious to his people. And so, verse 7, she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. A picture for you here on the screen, it's roughly around, and we don't know exactly like where from Moab they left, is it the center or the far end, did they go from the top likely, maybe could have went from the bottom, but about 100, over 100 kilometers, maybe 120 kilometers that they traveled this distance. They'd done it once before and they're doing it now again. Now 120 kilometers walking and moving, like I've moved before, you have a, even if you think you don't have a lot of stuff, you're still going to have more than you think. And to move and uproot and go that distance would take them a very long time and a long time to think. And it would seem that's exactly what Naomi did. She's thinking, and it seems that she has doubt. She's walking with her two daughters-in-law, and she begins to, and we hear what she's thinking. Look at verse 8. She says, we're told, but Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. Go back to Moab. We don't know how far along in the journey they were. She says, may the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me, as you've dealt with um, the loss of your husbands and your family. Verse 9, the Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. You can see there's love between them. And they're like, man, why are you still here? They're like dragging their heels, following her. Um, there's commitment, there's love, they're weeping. Naomi is with her whole heart like, hey, I want to protect these women. And here's the thing, though, without realizing it, she's testing their faith. And worse than that, she's actually tempting them to return back away from God. They're going to God. They've committed so far, and she's like, actually, no, this isn't safe. I don't know. I don't see hope really in sight. Just go back. Find a husband back there. She's tempting them to go back, find a Moabite husband, likely, very likely, to be under the nation who is ruled by Chemosh. Go back there, because I just don't know what's ahead. And so, verse 10, they said to her, no. So they're still committed. They're like, no. We will return with you to your people. And Naomi continues. She doesn't take no for an answer. Naomi continues. And she keeps giving advice, forgetting that God is her redeemer. She's insane right now. But if you look honestly at her situation, you'd say, well, this, but that makes sense. Like, what else could she do? She cares for them. She loves them. They love her. Man, they've, they've committed to so far. Like, just give the advice to go back. Turn back, she says, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Now, something we, you, you wouldn't know unless you kind of knew the times. In Deuteronomy 25, Israel was commended that if the situation happened, that happened here, that a wife was a widow, there was law, there was a Leverite law. So, Levar would be um, husband's brother. So, Leverite law, there was this law that if your husband died, someone then in the family, the other brother would come and marry you in order to protect you, in order that the family line would continue, in order to ensure land and inheritance. So, Ruth and Naomi need someone to marry. Well, Naomi has no one. That's what she's saying. She's like, I've got nothing for you. There are no brothers. 
the family is dead. And so this is why she says, I, I yet, or sorry, I, have I yet sons in my womb that it may become, or that they may become your husbands? She's like, they're not coming for me. Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night and should bear sons, like somehow, if, we, if this happened today, would you therefore wait till they're grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? Would you wait all that time? No. My daughters, for it's exceedingly bitter for, to me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone against, out against me. So again, she says, I have no husband, I have no sons, too old to start a family. If you go with me, there's no hope in sight. So she's pleading with them. And you look at 14, how they respond. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. It would seem they're counting the cost. They're like, all right, like we're considering that, but like what, we know what that means. And Orpha kissed her mother-in-law. And we hear this is like a goodbye kiss. Now hear this. Orpa loved Naomi. She was very committed to Naomi. And you can love God's people and you can go a long way with them. And I hope there won't be someone like this in our church. If our church goes, if I'm able to lead here for 30 years, that we wouldn't have someone that would go that long and not be redeemed and not actually commit to Christ. If you do not go all the way, you will not be redeemed by Christ. Christ died, he was buried, and he rose. That was all the way. We must identify with his death and his burial and his resurrection. It's not a halfway gospel. If it's not all the way, if it doesn't lead to our own spiritual death, I repent of who I am. I'm done. God, I'm yours. You are king. I'm a sinner doesn't come to that it's not redemption it's something that looks like it close but just leads to death and we hear what Ruth did though she clung to Naomi the word there is the same word used with husbands and wives cleave leave and cleave the idea being I'm not going anywhere death is going to separate us till death do us part and so Naomi continues to give Ruth reasons not to return with her. Orpah's gone, and she's like, all right, one more. And so she's going to continue with Ruth, and we need to be looking at this before we know what she's going to say, and we need to be thinking, Ruth, like we need to be thinking as we see those around us in our own church. No, 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 no. Don't give in. Don't, don't stop. Go all the way here. Don't go part way. And so here, Ruth's going to go and give the pitch. And so she says, verse 15, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people, to her gods, to what's familiar, to what's safe, to what makes sense. Return after your sister-in-law. Now Ruth talks. But Ruth said, and what is she going to say? Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. Basically saying, look, stop. For where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people. And listen, your God, my God. So she commits to the Redeemer. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. She's like, I'm not going anywhere. May the Lord do so to me. And she kind of gives this vow now. Do so to me. Or more also if anything but death parts me from you. Look, I'm, I'm going to do this. And so when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more. She's like, all right. So again, unknowingly, Naomi had both girls count the cost. She tempted them, really. God in that's testing them. But she's had them actually count the cost. 
and coming to Christ will cost you. And I will say this, if you've come to Christ, it has cost you. And if you've come to Christ, returning to him will cost you. It will cost you. It, it, it costs Naomi, and it's going to cost Ruth. It will cost you your own sin, your own habits that you like, your comforts, your own self-righteousness. It maybe will cost you your family. Ultimately, it will cost you yourself. It will cost you. But the cost should never stop us because we look at what we gain, and we gain God. We have our Redeemer, and we're brought back, and actually the cost then should cause us to commit. Christ did this all the time in witnessing. He had people count the cost. And I think sometimes um, the gospel that we present to people is so man-centered and so weak. There is no cost. It's except Christ, and everything's roses. He will, he will just, everything will be great. Well, it will be great because you'll have God, but you will lose your life. And so Christ did this all the time. Luke 14, 26 to 28 says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. You need to love me in a sense that it's as if you hate your family. You, you were willing to lose it all because of your love for Christ. Whoever does not bear his own cross, so if you will not suffer, and come after me. He doesn't say it's less than. It's, it's not ideal. He says you cannot be my disciple. For which of you desiring to build a tower. Does not first sit down and count the cost. Whether he has enough to complete it. And I think sometimes we. We maybe didn't count the cost enough. When we came to Christ. It's a work of God. You're saved. But we need to again look back. And be like okay, what did I actually do. Like what does it mean to be God's. Like what does it mean to be redeemed. And again count the cost. And I think. For some of us, we're like, it should be easier, it should be easier, it should be easier. Why, why, why? No. No, it's going to be hard. But count the cost, it's so worth it. It's so worth it. And so commit to return. And as you do, finally, third point, remember to hope. Remember to hope, and now the, the story finishes describing their arrival back, you could say, with God. Verse 19, so the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. There, they're back. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? The whole town gets word of it. Seems the town knows who or knew who Naomi was. They gather and they, you can, she's, she's come here and you wonder if like, well, it's just Naomi and she's got one girl with her. If they're like, okay, wait, is this Naomi? I think more likely too, it was also because or more so because of how she looked. She'd been gone 10 years away from God. And that doesn't age you well. And, and I think, in some ways, they didn't recognize her. Now, you know, I, I was thinking about this, and I thought, man, you know, this isn't always because of sin, right? But I look back at my wedding picture. Maybe you can do the same with yours and be like, uh, yikes. <laughs> some of you, I think, if I showed you my wedding picture, you'd be like, is that Kyle? Or you have people say to you, like, um, if you're feeling great, and they say to you, man, you, you look tired. <laughs> And they're like, oh, I don't feel tired. But you, you look it, right? And so Naomi looked a certain way so much so they're like, is that actually her? Like she, I hardly recognize her. But she looks how she is in this case. They would say, you look tired. She's like, I'm tired. You look broken and destroyed. She's like, I am. So she's looking the part and they honestly, they, they hardly recognize her. And so she explains. She's like, no, it's me. She said to them, but do not call me Naomi. So don't call me pleasantness. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. So she like changes her name. She's like, no, nah, let's start calling me this. Call me bitter. And, and here's why. She blames the Lord for her poor state. 
that she's in, in four ways. I don't have them on the screen. You can maybe write them down if you're taking notes. But the first is this harshness. That God was harsh. She says, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me, harshly with me. Secondly, she says, call me bitter. Why? Because of loss. She blames the Lord for her loss. Verse 21, I went away full and the Lord has brought me back empty. Which is interesting because Ruth's right beside her. How does Ruth feel? She's like, no, I got nothing. Third, opposition. She blames God for opposition. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me? God is opposed, like in court. He's like, no, guilty. And then fourth, affliction. The Almighty has brought calamity upon me. She has returned. She's returned. I mean, there's, there's food in the land. But she's forgotten her God. She's entirely forgotten, not just her God, but that God is her Redeemer. So like Job, uh, she might be able to say, hey, what's happened to me is because of God. And sin or not, it's like God is sovereign and, and, and God is bringing me through this. The, the valley of the shadow of death. But also, it's very likely, a lot of her suffering is because of her own sin. They left God. But the real suffering, the reason she's saying, call me bitter, is because she has forgotten that she has a Redeemer who loves her. And we see this through the book, and this is a theme all through Scripture, certainly through the Old Testament, but God's love in that word is hased. That's Hebrew. It's the steadfast love of God. Steadfast because it's immovable no matter what the circumstances are. It's firm. And then love because it's tender and affectionate. She has a God who loves her, tender and affectionate, has not left her, has not failed her, but she has forgotten in her context, some of it just God bringing her through in his wisdom, and some of it because of her sin that she has a redeemer. She can turn. She can return to God. But she's just blaming him. And here's the thing. You can return to God. You can repent and you can still feel hopeless like Naomi. Call me bitter. And what do we do in those times? And this happens often. We must remember who we have returned to. Now I've repented. I've returned. And who to? My Redeemer. My Redeemer. You will be redeemed. Why? Because you are loved. What does that mean? You have hope. If you've returned, then don't lose hope and, and get your eyes back on God and be like, praise God, you've returned. And so have hope. Don't lose hope. Remember, you've returned to the one who buys us back, to your Redeemer. So there is hope. He loves you. In verse 22, so... We hear Naomi returned. And listen, Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab. So again, on all accounts, things are hopeless. There's no husbands, there's no children, there's no land, there's no future. But no matter what we read next, if you just stop there, you can be certain that they have hope. Why? Because they've returned to God. And our circumstances tend to cause us to be like, no, I just, I'm not really sure yet. We can be sure because we know who our God is. He is their redeemer. And they came, it says, to Bethlehem. Again, now the house of bread, the city of the king, David, at the beginning of the barley harvest. So now it's, they're back and it's a harvest. It's harvest time, not a famine. Ruth had found and will find God to be her redeemer. She's come out of Moab. So Christ is our redeemer and we must be redeemed by him. Say it again. 
goes for every one of us. You must be rescued by Christ. You must be rescued by Christ or you will face spiritual famine and certain eternal everlasting death apart from God with no hope. You must be rescued by Christ. Christ is our Redeemer. So like Ruth, that must be a case for you. And for all of us, like Naomi, if Christ is our Redeemer, then you must be redeemed by Him. And we must then continue to return to God, and I would say this daily. Continue to return to your God. Every moment that you stray away, return to Him. Repent and return. And He will rescue you. He will redeem you. He loves you. So we are going to see this uh, all through this book. Christ is our Redeemer. Let me pray, and then we will sing together. Father, I pray that you would convince us as a church of what maybe all of us would say. My God is King. Christ is my Redeemer. And Lord, that we would be, uh, for some of us here, maybe this would be the first time that we would commit all the way, that we would repent of our sin as rebels against God, against you. Lord, that we would turn from our sin and be willing to lose all things because we have nothing apart from you. We'd receive forgiveness from Christ. Trust in his death to pay for our sin. Trust in his life to give us life. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here, they would not continue just to come Sunday to Sunday and commit um, part way, but that today would be the day of salvation. So Lord, I do that work. We cannot delay. Lord, and for us who know, again, convince us as a church, God is King. Christ is my Redeemer. And Lord, would we then come often without shame, often searching out, like, where do I need to, uh, to turn, Lord, and that we would be redeemed and to have hope and experience the love of our God. So, Lord, um, thank you that you are our Redeemer, Lord. Um, fitting that we would sing now and, and give you praise. In Jesus' name.